So far in this course, we focused on performance and energy aspects of processor design. In the next few videos, I'm going to focus on security aspects. So why are we focusing on security? So in early 2018, the meltdown and spectral attacks were disclosed and they showed that hardware design choices can expose major vulnerabilities in the processor. These were high profile attacks and they received tons of press coverage. They affected millions of computers and they introduced the world to terms like speculation, branch prediction and out of order execution. And these are all terms that we've already discussed in class and so now is a good time to dive into the details of these attacks and understand just how easy and how diabolical these attacks were. This is important to understand because in the future we are likely to see such similar attacks and we are also likely to see processors that introduce features that can help defend against such attacks. In this video I'm going to focus on Meltdown which is easier to understand and also easier to fix. In fact Meltdown is a hardware design oversight by Intel and so it only affects Intel chips. Next generation chips even by Intel will likely fix this oversight and in the meantime the problem has been fixed with software patches that introduce a modest performance penalty. So let me start by explaining Meltdown with a simple analogy. Let's say that you are hard at work at your desk and you're busy working on a code release deadline, let's say, and along comes this strange person over here and he says that he's been sent by your spouse who is apparently applying for a bank loan and needs a copy of your pay stubs and a statement of your retirement account. And obviously you hear this and think this is a very strange request because my spouse and I have never discussed this, uh, this loan and so this certainly sounds a little fishy, right? So you obviously do the right thing and you send a text to your spouse right away saying, there's a stranger here who wants to get my statements. Did you really send this person? And you know, now you're waiting for that response to come back. And in the meantime, you're talking about the weather and you know, there's only so much small talk that you can do. You want to get back to your deadline. And so at this point you say, well, you know, just to save time, let me go ahead and print these statements anyway. So you go ahead and print these statements, but you're obviously very smart. You're not going to just hand these statements over to this person. You're going to hold on to them and you're going to wait for that response to come back from your spouse. So now let me just take a break from this analogy and move to the processor world. So let's say that I am an attacker program that is trying to read secrets that belong to somebody else. So I may issue a load instruction that's trying to read data from a memory location that I'm not authorized to access. Now obviously processors are smart enough to have checks in place to make sure that you can only access data that you have permissions to access. But processors like you on a deadline are also very impatient. So we know that processors employ all kinds of speculation techniques, right? You end up bringing the next bunch of instructions. You start issuing instructions early even before some previous instructions have finished. And in some cases, you even start executing these instructions before you have enforced your permission checks. So you printing these documents is like a processor speculatively issuing an illegal instruction. All right, so now let's say that the, the response comes back from your spouse and he tells you that he has sent nobody and this is obviously a malicious request, right? So at that point, you dismiss this person, you angrily dismiss this person and you take the document and you send it through a shredder. So no harm done, right? There was this person who came and issued a request. You did things speculatively. When you realized that this was an illegal access, you went ahead and squashed the steps that you have taken. And this person has now had to leave without access to your data. And in exactly the same way, the processor also sometimes speculatively issues an instruction. And once the permission checks are performed, those instructions are squashed. And so the malicious program never has access to your data. So in this elaborate example and in the processor world, things have been designed correctly so that your secrets are not just handed over to an attacker. 
but there are some side effects, there are some footprints being left behind which a persistent attacker might be able to exploit. So in this example, you know, this person who's just been kicked out comes back wearing a disguise. Now he's dressed as a janitor and he walks up to the trash can, takes the contents of the trash can, goes home and then starts to put together all of these shredded pieces of paper and there he has all of your bank statements and all of your private information. And in a similar way, when the processor speculatively executes the illegal instruction, it is leaving some footprints behind in the cache because those particular blocks of data were brought into the cache and those instructions were eventually squashed, but those blocks still exist in the cache. And so if you are a persistent attacker, maybe there are ways for you to figure out exactly what has been brought into cache. All right, so let's set this analogy aside and let's move to the processor world and let's look at the specific code that the attacker would write to try and steal your secrets. So the attacker starts by filling the cache with its own data structure X. Then it issues a load to a memory location that it is not authorized to access, right? So let's say that this is the memory address space and let's say that here's a block of data and let's say that it has the value five sitting in here. And so that's a secret and this thread actually does not have access to that piece of data. Let's say it belongs to the kernel. So this processor goes ahead and issues this load instruction and tries to bring the value five into register R1. So ideally the processor should be performing some checks to make sure that you have permissions to access this data. But while those checks are being performed in the background, the processor speculatively starts doing the next set of instructions as well. So it takes this value R1 and uses it as an address to fetch the next block of data as well. So what it ends up doing is it ends up bringing a block of data over here which has an address of 5. And so this data is also brought into the processor. And so as a result, if you look at the cache, there were two blocks that were just fetched into the cache. There was this block over here which contained the number 5 and then there was a second block with address 5. And let's say that you know the address corresponds to the index into the cache. So this block that was brought in gets placed over here and its index in the cache is the number 5. Now at some point the processor decides that it has had enough, right? It has done the permissions checks, it has figured out that you're trying to do some illegal accesses and so it ends up squashing these two instructions. And it returns control back to some code in the attacker's program. And so once the attacker gets control back, it says, well, you know, let me just walk through the cache again and let me read my data structure X. So at this point, it's going to walk through every element of the cache. And as it performs this walk, it's also going to measure how long it takes to fetch each of those elements of X. And so when it accesses the first element, which is sitting in the cache, it has a cache hit, accesses the next few elements, they're also cache hits. And then when it tries to access its fifth element over here, it now encounters a cache miss because the fifth element of X has been evicted by this block that was brought in. So at this point, the attacker experiences a longer latency to access element number five. And that's how it realizes that the secret value sitting in the kernel's memory is the number five. So you'll see what's happened over here, right? There were some illegal instructions that were speculatively executed. They left some footprints behind. They basically brought something into the cache and the secret value was never directly revealed to the attacker. But because those footprints were left behind, the attacker was able to take this next step. It was able to essentially walk through the cache, measure the latencies for each of its accesses, and it was able to figure out that the fifth element took longer to access, and hence the secret value is five. And so this is referred to as information leakage through side channels. And the main problem happened because, you know, we had a reorder buffer and there was this load instruction over here, which was illegal. And when I discovered that I had made an illegal access, I just set a bit over here saying that this instruction should eventually be squashed. But in the meantime, I allowed all of these subsequent instructions to proceed and they all left footprints behind in the cache. Right? And much later, when this instruction was ready to be committed, 
that's when I realized that there was an illegal access and that's when I squash all of these instructions. Right? So this is a hardware design oversight where what should have happened is that once you realize that you don't have permissions over here, this load should not be allowed to proceed. It should not be allowed to bring a certain block into the cache and it should not be allowed to leave these footprints behind. And you can have other techniques as well that try to defend against such an attack. And so this was an overview of the meltdown attack. And in the next video, I'll focus on the spectra attack.